We're going to the 21st chapter of the book of Acts. And um, getting into a new chapter here of uh, Paul's ministry is basically uh, what is happening here. Um, you know, pretty much the rest of this is to concentrate on what's going on there. Um, uh, we're going to uh, verse 15 of chapter 21 and I'm going to read in the NLT chapter 21 and verse um, 15. Verse 15. After this we packed our things and left for Jerusalem. Some believers from Caesarea accompanied us. They took us to the home of Manasseh, a man originally from Cyprus and one of the early believers. When, he, when we arrived, the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem welcomed us warmly. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Almighty God, for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. We know, Lord God, that you can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, and that you are a powerful God, and that you know, Lord God, things that man in this earth cannot even realize. And we pray for your miraculous moving, Lord God, within our hearts within our minds, Lord God, Lord Jesus, and within our spirits, and Lord God, in our lives, that we become that which you have desired us to be. Lord God, that we be a flame and a candle and a light, Lord God, in this hour, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. You may be seated. They had uh, and just to review a little bit, because uh, being gone, uh, this uh, Paul was already told that if he goes to Jerusalem, that uh, by uh, many different, every church that he basically stopped at, somebody prophesied to him that um, uh, he would be facing um, uh, some struggles, and that. Uh, he would end up being arrested. Uh, it's basically a prophecy, and uh, and that his ministry was going to change quite, um, uh, you know, quite abruptly. And so he knows that the Lord has led him to go there. Uh, the Lord had already let him know about this previous to all these prophecies to him. And, uh, and so uh, uh, we find here that, you know, the Lord is letting the church know that what's happening to Paul is something that the Lord's going to use. They may not understand it. It, be, it is something that we find here in the scripture uh, that we had studied uh, in, uh, earlier, that many of them cried and wept, uh, uh, you know, basically on Paul's shoulder, uh, and they didn't want him to leave, uh, and they, because, you know, uh, they wanted to be able to come back and minister to them, uh, because they were quite grateful for what the Lord uh, had done through Paul, uh, to bringing the gospel to their various uh, areas uh, in uh, throughout Asia and through uh, some areas of Eastern Europe, there it, it was um, it was a pretty uh, you know powerful ministry uh, you know in respects to responses uh, how can I say to the energy that was uh, demonstrated 
spiritual moving of the Lord, uh, you know, miracles, signs. Uh, they would be preaching many times in uh, outside areas um, that were once reserved for, you know, worshiping um, and for uh, playing. Uh, uh, they would do that both to the gods, usually in the outdoors. Um, uh, that was common amongst the pagans. And uh, so they would, uh, so Paul was transforming those places into places where, you know, the Lord would move and that, you know, the power of God and the truth would be taught and, and uh, not just taught but preached. And that, again, literally uh, cities would be transformed uh, from that ministry, okay? Uh, he's, he's accomplishing that which, you know, was said in, um, in Luke and in Matthew, and that, you know, and this is what we've been teaching. And basically, Luke is carrying on the message that uh, he ends the book of Luke with, okay? He is... He's going to, okay, now, you know, this centered around, you know, Jesus' ministry. Now we're going to center around uh, the apostolic ministry of uh, the apostles. Uh, uh, Peter taking center stage in the beginning and then moving to Paul into center stage as we move more into the outreach uh, to the Gentiles. This, um, uh, <clears throat> this is the flow of the book. This is the, the flow of uh, basically, uh, you know, it, it follows the ending of the book of Luke, okay? It follows the theme that Jesus Okay, pronounced, and he's recording it. Okay, uh, uh, Luke uh, has gathered uh, much of this, and as what we know as the Book of Acts, and um, as we uh, study through here on the teaching and preaching. In other words, we talked about the Acts of the Apostles, but no, it is the answer to the command. Okay? This is what it looks like. This is what it is. Okay? Um, this is what happens. And we see that there's been persecution in the midst of this. We see that there's been suffering in the midst of all this uh, for those who have, um, you know, basically, uh, you know, uh, turned from whether they were pagan or whether they were following um, Judaism and following basically the law and, and uh, uh, of the Old Testament, which Jesus came to fulfill, okay? And so um, this was even a struggle for many of the Jews from throughout uh, these various cities throughout Asia uh, and in Europe it was very hard for them to really kind of follow after this. It, it, it became a very uh, much of a struggle for the early church. The early church, uh, you know, was going through a tremendous amount of change uh, and it was going through a lot of growth and um, it, it was, um, how can I say, expanding quite quickly. But 
the Jews who became believers were having a hard time forgetting the, you know, the law of Moses. And in fact, as the temple, you know, still stood, this became, uh, how can I say, this became even a hard thing for the uh, church to get across the idea that the sacrifices of the Old Testament law were no longer required because Jesus fulfilled that. But there was a lot of Jews who said, no, 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 we must practice the law. But now that we have this salvation through Jesus Christ, okay, we're going to continue, you know, worshiping here in the temple and doing what we've done in the past. And because he is the Messiah and their expectation was that Jesus would come back soon and relieve them again from the Romans. Okay. Um, this became, uh, you know, this became more and more of a, a, of a problem for the church. It really did. It became a problem for the church. It became a problem to say, listen, that we are, that it is through the blood of Jesus Christ and through our faith that he is the Messiah, that he is the Savior, and that we follow the things that Jesus gave, uh, you know, uh, his, his disciples, uh, his apostles, and that we would follow those ways and that we would live in those ways and that we would not be bound and, and where Jesus said, you know, uh, you have, they had basically perverted the law into something that it was not, instead of seeing what it was to represent and what God was planning to do for the future of humankind. They refused to see it because all they wanted to see was, how can I say, those Gentiles that gave us problems, they wanted to see them all dead. Okay? And so there was a tremendous amount of, how can I say, uh, prejudice against those who were not Jewish. A tremendous amount of prejudice that was uh, against those who were not Jewish and for the church to break uh, to break the how can I say uh, the sacred line of Jewish belief and begin to minister to Gentiles uh, despite how the Gentiles looked and how they were that and, uh, you know, without this long time of purification and these uh, basically going through uh, the years that it took and generations that it took uh, for them to actually become truly Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, this them being involved and even being coming to the temple was just a slap in the face to many of the people who were in the church at the time. Because they didn't see them living and dressing and acting and practicing the same eating requirements and all these different things that went along with Judaism. <clears throat> okay and so that also they were not practicing the cleansing uh, rites that the Jews would practice on a daily place, uh, basis and so this was you know this for them to come to the temple 
again, was a great slap in the face. So the early church did have quite a problem. And part of the problem was that that temple was still there. Which the Lord was going to solve that problem. And he prophesied about it. He prophesied about it when he was walking the earth. And he told him, he said, weep not for me, but for your children. He says, if they do this to the green tree, what will they do to the dry? Okay? He was already giving them an indication of what was going to happen to them. Okay? say, well, he, why did he just tell them that they were going to be put on crosses and tarred and feathered and, you know, and set up as lights in the city, uh, security lights, as they were planted on crosses around the city when they were conquered. Okay? These Jews their children were the ones on the crosses. And they were the ones who were tarred and feathered and set on fire. Okay? And he said, don't weep for me, but weep for your children. Forty years from now, you, you're going to regret what you did. Okay? And pretty much 40 years to the day, they regretted what they done. Right. Okay. So the Lord prophesied to him. He said, well, why is, you know, why is he, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that, you know, doesn't just come out and say it. that's the way God's always been. You got a problem with that, you type that up with him. It's not my problem. Okay? It's yours and his. Okay? The thing is, this is the way God speaks. This is the way he always will. And this is the way he always conveys his message. Any kind of prophecy is sometimes, in many ways, somewhat vague. We can look at the prophecies and that Paul received. Okay? Alright? They symbolized something that he was going to be taken. Okay? And that he would be a prisoner. Yeah. It did not it did not speak of immediate death. It did not speak of long, you know, how many years afterwards that all this happened. It didn't the Lord did not speak that through those prophecies. That was a, those prophecies were of God. They were spirit filled and of the Holy Ghost. But sometimes people are too carnal for their own good. In the in respects that sometimes you have to reach into the spiritual realm. And you've got to under, and, and you have to put some effort out yourself. Okay, you say, well, I, I don't study well. Okay, that's that's good. You can, your mouth still moves, and you can pray. That's right. Okay. The, the thing is, see, the Lord has a way for us to get to Him. Despite what we think we are able or not able to do, this is uh, this is a this is the way that the Lord has made it. He's made it simple enough that those uh, that are you know that are you know impaired, whether they are, you know, mentally impaired or physically impaired somehow that they can receive the Holy Ghost. Okay?
Okay? I have seen it myself. I have been there. I have witnessed it. Deaf and dumb people received the Holy Ghost by the evidence of speaking in tongues. I watched it myself. So clear. So pure. When you're talking about powerful move of God, that gets people's attention. And they begin to praise God and they begin to worship God and they begin to say, listen, only the Lord could do that. So there's not a doubt. There is, there is a recognition of how much the Lord can do. And so this teaching and preaching that was done it, it went into all facets of life, depending whether these people were servants or whether these, these people uh, were of the higher echelon. Paul was able to minister to them all. The gospel was shared to them all. Okay? And so the message that Jesus spoke in other words, it's going to be to all people. Okay? In other words, the prophecy of the Old Testament was going to be fulfilled. And, and what Peter spoke on the day of Pentecost was fulfilled. He spoke about the prophet Joel. And what was spoken of him. Okay? He repeated the, how can I say, the scripture and what was said and what was written hundreds of years before all this happened. Okay? Though they did not, even though people did not understand what it meant, they did not quite maybe draw, draw the, put the lines together. But that's what Jesus came to do. He came and put it, and started putting it together. And they still didn't get it until the ascension, and, and until those 40 days that Jesus spent with his apostles, okay, and, and with those guys. And then they began to understand what was going on. The Lord wanted them to dig. The Lord wanted them to move in the direction towards him. He wanted them to move out of the carnal and move into the spiritual. To be accustomed to reaching into the spiritual, uh, how can I say, treasure chest of God. Come on. Instead into the carnal treasure chest of me. This is how the Jews thought and believed that they were blessed was through carnal treasures. Okay? And so the idea that the apostles began to really understand and get this was that we find that silver and gold have we none, but such as we give thee, such as we have, give I thee. Okay. They had learned to pull out of the treasure set chest of the spiritual. Okay. And to bring it into the realm of humanity. And to make a difference. To make a difference. Hallelujah. So, we have, what's the problem? Okay, that I'm getting at. You got a bunch of religious people 
who are already religious, who know the scripture, who are taught to memorize it as children. They're religious people. They're really religious people. They were called in times past the people of the book in history. It's actually the truth. In ancient history, there are some writings about them that they were known as the people of the book. Okay. How's that happen? Right. Well, that, that means they got a reputation of being religious, but in a different way than many others. It's not quite the same way as the paganistic religions. It's a God-centered religion. So we have these people that are thinking that they're not far off anyhow, and that uh, you know, once they have seen the move of the Holy Ghost, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, and they were willing to say, yes, Jesus, and yes, he's coming back again. We just got, you know, we're just off on our time. Yeah. On our timing and on our expectation of the timing. And so all this has got to happen. So they became, they were baptized in Jesus' name, and they were filled uh with the Holy Ghost by the evidence of speaking in tongues. All this stuff happened to them. But they were already religious. We live in the same world today. We live in a place where everybody's Christian or have a Christian heritage. And so, the same problems when it comes to the mentality and things that ought to be done, yes, we'll, we'll accept the move of the Spirit. We'll accept the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Christendom has, you know, has stood up and, and, and said this in many various places and all these different things. And, and God had poured, you know, uh, you know, seven, you know, the 1970s were a, a time of decision. And it went the wrong way. Because there was a great outpouring of the Holy Ghost amongst many of these churches that used to say that it was all of the devil. And then when this charismatic movement had risen up and, and became, you know, uh, quite popular, you know, they, these people were already religious. Yeah. The idea of changing what they do was a whole different other question. And here was the problem. The church in Jerusalem was trying to somehow pacify so they could still use the temple as a place of worship. As it happened. Okay. And so, <laughs> what I'm getting at is that this message does bring change. But whether you're religious, whether you're not religious, change is going to have to happen. It is not to keep you in the sin that you lived in. It is not to keep you in the falseness of your self-conceived religious ideas. It is to bring you the teaching and the preaching of the gospel and what was brought to by the apostles and, 
and what changed Paul's life so drastically And that drastic change is what he was ministering to the Jews across the areas and the synagogues that he would go to because of his status and because of who he was. He had every right to go into a Jewish synagogue and teach and preach. And that's what he did. He taught, preached, and did these things. And, and, and all this began to cause the church uh, in that early day to, to you know, somehow, uh, you know, hopefully that over time we can get these Jews into the right frame of mind. And it was not happening. So Paul's ministry in these Gentile areas stirred up a lot of resentment and kicked up a lot of proverbial dust in the faces of these Jewish believers. And so, this began to be even a greater problem. And we come to a head here. Paul goes back to Jerusalem. He is warmly welcomed by, you know, those, his brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. But as we go on here in the scripture, it says the next day, Paul went, uh, went with us to meet with James and the elders of Jerusalem the church, uh, uh, Jerusalem church, were present. After greeting them, Paul gave a detailed account of the things that God had accomplished among the Gentiles through his ministry. After hearing this, they praised God and then said, You know, dear brother, how many thousands of Jews have also believed? And they all follow the law of Moses very seriously. Okay? So this is not my idea. This is what Scripture says. In other words, they're believers, but they follow the law very seriously. Okay? But the Jewish believers here in Jerusalem have been told that you are teaching all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn their backs on, on the laws of Moses. They've heard that you teach them not to circumcise their children or follow other Jewish customs. What should we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. Here's what we uh, want you to do. We have four men here who have completed their vow. Go with them to the temple and join them in the purification ceremony. Paying for them to have their heads richly shaved. Then everyone will know that the rumors are false and that you yourself observe the Jewish laws. Verse 25. As the Gentiles, uh, as the Gentile believers, they should do what we already told them in a letter. They should abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood or meat of uh, strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. So Paul went to the temple the next day with the other men. 
they had already started the purification ritual, and so he publicly announced the date then when the vows, which would end in separate. Uh, and, and sacrifices would be offered for each of them. The seven days were almost ended when some of the Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul in the temple and roused a mob against him. They grabbed him, yelling, Men of Israel, help us. This is the man who preaches against our people uh, everywhere and tells everybody to disobey the Jewish laws. He speaks against the temple and even defiles this holy place by bringing in Gentiles. Uh, no, he doesn't. There's a quarter of the Gentiles that was put into the temple and the Jews used it for commerce. That's what Jesus went to upset. that he was upsetting was in the court of the Gentiles. And the Jews turned it into a place where they would sell sacrifices. They had money changers there. Oh, they were raking in the box. But they did it so no Gentiles would be able to come in there. You see what I'm saying? They hate it was immense. And it was so long standing that to even see a Gentile in the court of the Gentiles was a slap in the face. And they said it was against Jewish law. No. <laughs> God said there should be a court of the Gentiles. Okay, for earlier that day, they had seen him in the city with Trophimus, a Gentile from Ephesus, and they assumed Paul had taken him into the temple. The whole city was rocked by these accusations, and a great riot followed. Paul was grabbed and dragged out of the temple, and immediately the gates were closed behind him. As they were trying to kill him, word reached the commander of the Roman regiment that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately called out his soldiers and officers, and they ran down among the crowd. When the mob saw the commander and the troops coming, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander arrested him and ordered him bound with two chains. He asked the crowd who he was and what he had done. Some shouted out one thing and some another. Since he couldn't find out the truth in the uproar and confusion, he ordered that Paul be taken to the fortress. As Paul reached the stairs, the mob grew so violent the soldiers had to uh, lift him uh, to their shoulders to protect him. And the crowd followed behind, shouting, kill him, kill him. As Paul was about to be taken inside, he said to the commander, may I have a word with you? Uh, do you know Greek? The commander Asked, surprised, aren't you the Egyptian who led the rebellion some time ago and took 4,000 members of the assassins out into the desert? No, Paul replied. I'm a Jew and a, city, a citizen of Tarsus of Cilicia, which is an important city Please let me talk to these people. The commander agreed. So Paul stood on the stairs and motioned to the people to be quiet. 
Soon a deep silence enveloped the crowd, and he addressed them in their language, which is Aramaic. It's pretty powerful. Let's go to the next chapter. Okay. It says here, brothers and esteemed fathers, Paul said, listen to me. I offer my defense. When they heard him speaking in their own language, the silence was even greater. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus a city in Cilicia. I was brought up and educated here in Jerusalem under Gamaliel. As his student, I was carefully trained in our Jewish laws and customs. I became very zealous to honor God in everything I did, just like all you today. And I per persecuted the followers of the way, hounding some to death, arresting both men and women and throwing them in prison. The high priest and the whole council of the elders can testify that this is so. For I received letters from them to our Jewish brothers in Damascus, authoring my Rising me to bring the Christians from uh, there to Jerusalem in chains to be punished. As I was on the road approaching Damascus about noon, a very bright light from heaven suddenly shone down around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Paul, Saul, Saul, why are you? you persecuting me. He said, who are you, Lord? I asked. And a voice replied and said, I am Jesus the Nazarene. And the one you are persecuting. The people with me saw the light but did not understand the voice speaking to me. I asked, what should I do, Lord? And the Lord told me, get up and go on to, on to Damascus. And there you will be told everything you are to do. This is a very intense moment for Paul. Yeah. Let me say that suffering can come along with this. There's a message that the Lord's given to me that if the Lord wills, I'll try to preach it. And it's basically on this idea of suffering. He said, I was blinded by intense light. This thing happened to him. See, you say, why did the Lord work that way? Why did he do it that way? Well, intense light coming down from heaven in the mindset of the people of that day is, how can I say, it ministers not only to the Jews, but also will minister to those who are pagans. How? How be it? Well, many, okay, the gods that they would serve would always, there would always be the symbol of the sun involved in it. And this disc that's used that, um, that was part of the ancient world. This is how they communicated that God, oh, this is a God-like thing. So when he said this light shone out of heaven, immediately to the pagan says, this is a some this is a God thing going on. Yeah. Okay. 
okay? And to the pagan, the pagan's asking, who's the God? Because he's got to be a great God. He's, he's the highest God because only the highest gods get this kind of activation. Okay? To the Jews, uh-oh. We must have crossed the line. We know what that great light is. It hit Moses one day. And Moses' face shone for a long period of time. And his face had to be covered because our ancestors couldn't handle it. Okay? So, whether they're Gentile who practices paganism, or whether they're Jew, this is why God acted, and this is why God did what he did. It's the exact reason. He was ministering to the people of that time on their level of understanding. And he gave Paul a testimony that will relate to to all peoples throughout the whole world. Wow. That's how great our God is. This was not happenstance. This was intentional. This only God said, well, today I'm going to do the light thing. Okay, no. This this wasn't that. Okay? This was God ministering to a people. And when they heard this, it was like, okay. This is brighter than the new day sun. I think we need to give him some attention. Okay, and so he, you know, he really uh, gave us the account um, of what was going on, and I'm closing here. <coughs> he asked who it was, and this answered the question for for the pagan and has answered the question of who Jesus really was for the Jew. Okay? Because all that aligned to not just Jesus being some kind of second person in a holy trinity, but that Jesus was something bigger than that. Much bigger than that. And that's what our Gentile brothers and sisters, after 300 years, forgot. And that's why we're in the religious mess. The message is clear throughout the book of Acts. Some people say, well, that's an earlier part of the book of Acts. It's, no, 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 You know, sometimes people need to pursue after God and not after tradition. They need to see God and understand.
understand that he is the giver of understanding and light. And they have need. You know, they need to get out of themselves. But because of their unwillingness, this will be a question that will never be answered to them. Because 